Welcome back, Exile, to another video in Noodle's Complete Lore series. This video covers Act 5 and our return to Oriath. Let's get started. At the end of Act 4, we travel to the top of Mount Veruso and find a large device called the Resonator that activates a portal to Oriath. This device was left by Dominus, and is how Piety and Dominus were able to travel between Rayclast and Oriath without raising suspicion. We enter the portal and end up in the slave pens of Theopolis, capital city of Oriath. As we heard from Maramoa in Sarn and the Marraketh of Highgate, Oriath has continued the Empire's tradition of enslaving the Karui, Marraketh, and Ezemites. Oriath slave enforcers attack us as we make our way through the pens but we also see slaves who are friendly and also fighting these enemies. All across the ground you can see corpses and grates where hands desperately reach out to escape. A slave rebellion has begun. We fight our way through the pens until we come across Overseer Crow. When we kill him, a ladder is lowered from above, allowing us to escape the rebellion in the pens to the Overseer's Tower. The Overseer's Tower was once run by the Oriath who controlled and sold the slaves below, but it is now the refuge of a strange, mixed group of survivors of the Rebellion. Hiding in the tower are Utula, Lani, and Valenta. Utula is a Karui who has been a slave in Oriath. He started the slave rebellion we just fought through, in the name of the Karui god Kitava, who Utula calls the Tormented One. Utula says Kitava, the immortal slave, understands our plight like no other. In regards to the slaves, he has rallied into rebellion. Lani is a half Karui, half Oriath woman. She was raised as an Oriath and not a Karui slave, but in this rebellion she sided with the Karui slaves and fought two overseers herself, which left her mortally wounded. Lani credits Valenta with saving her life. Valenta is an Oriath woman who specializes in medicine. She was actually experimenting on the Karui slaves before the rebellion. But when she saved Lani's life, Lani insisted that Valenta be allowed to live. Valenta and Piety worked for Dominus together. And Valenta says, Piety and I have devoted ourselves to the betterment of the human condition. As for our methods, Piety had a saying that summed it up nicely. Would you consider the feelings of the stones when constructing a glorious cathedral in the name of God? When Piety left for Rayclast, Valenta was furious, as Valenta felt she had devoted her life and her work to Piety's vision. She created a tool called the Miasmeter, which she used to keep an eye on Rayclast, particularly Piety. Valenta tells us that through this instrument she heard the beast scream as it died, and she knows it was our doing. Valenta had to leave the Miasmeter behind during the Slave Rebellion, and she wants us to retrieve it. Lani wants us to find and kill Justicar Casticus, the man who supplied Karui slaves to Valenta for her experiments. We leave the tower to the control blocks, which is where Valenta used to experiment on slaves. We travel through this maze of a slave pen and find Valenta's Miasmeter, and also run into Justicar Casticus, who Valenta used to work alongside. Justicar Casticus is a member of the Templars, which High Templar Dominus used to lead. We kill Justicar Casticus and make our way out of the control blocks into the large open area of the Oriath Square, Center Theopolis. This square connects to every major area of Theopolis. These areas include the Templar Courts, the Cathedral, the Ossuary, and the Reliquary. The Templars have been their own power in Oriath since before the Purity Rebellion but the founding of Oriath itself is unclear. A man named Templar Devaro, a contemporary under High Templar Dominus, studied artifacts brought from Rayclast to Oriath about the Val. Through his research, there is evidence that the Val were on Oriath as well. Before now, Oriath was untouched by the cataclysm that plagued Rayclast, but there has clearly been unrest. The death of High Templar Dominus seems to be a partial catalyst for this change, but something else seems to be motivating this rebellion. The Templar Courts and the Chamber of Innocence are the center stronghold for the Templars. The Templars are a religious order, and as we make our way through the courts to the inner chambers, we learn about their god, Innocence. Innocence is an ancient god, and in the Chamber of Innocence we read his origins on the ornate stained glass. 
Innocence and Sin are brother gods from the mother of two. The story says that Innocence listened to their mother and was rewarded for his virtuous nature. Sin stole and lied, and so Innocence told the mother that Sin was beyond rule and redemption, and Sin was burned to ash. Mankind breathed in the ash of Sin, and Sin took root in the bodies of men and women and children. Innocence swore to burn all traces of Sin in the world. No matter where the ashes of Sin fell, his purifying flames would rise to meet them. The Templar Order started when Innocence created a weapon called the Staff of Purity and bestowed it to the first High Templar, named Maximus. This weapon was part of Innocence himself and thus imbued with his essence. The Templars have worshipped Innocence and the idea of purifying mankind of sin ever since their inception. Both High Templar Vol and High Templar Dominus held the same seat yet they had very different standards of purity. Vol, as we saw in his Purity Rebellion, believed all thaumaturgy was evil and planned to destroy the root of it. Dominus saw thaumaturgy as a way to become more powerful, to give himself and his followers the touch of God. At the end of the Chamber of Innocence, we meet the newly appointed High Templar, Avarius. Utula tells us, with Dominus away in Rayclast, someone had to keep the wheels of oppression turning. Avarius was only too happy to take the job. It was Avarius who led some of the largest and most crippling raids upon the Namakanui. It was on his orders that men, women, and children were shackled and shipped like cattle to Theopolis. And it was Avarius who spent 5,000 Karui lives building his Templar courts and his Chamber of Innocence, who had wives and daughters scrub their husbands' and fathers' blood from the stones so as to preserve their purity. We fight High Templar Avarius, who seems fanatic. When he falls, something similar to Dominus's transformation happens. Only this time Avarius does not turn into a vision of nightmare, he becomes a god, innocence. While Utula and Valenta have hinted at this as we progress through Oriath, it is now clear. Somehow, gods of old roam free. This is the true cause of panic and uprising in Oriath. When Utula says that he is a follower of Kitava, he does not simply refer to the lessons of this old god. He has communion with the real Kitava. And, naturally, Innocence, when reborn, goes to the Templars that worship him. Innocence chose High Templar Avarius and took over his body. Fighting Innocence is significantly more challenging than fighting Avarius, but upon his defeat, the aforementioned brother of Innocence, the god Sin, appears. We can now assume all gods in the lore of Rayclast and Oriath might be real. Unlike the Templar's writings about Sin, it seems that Sin is actually concerned for the well-being of mankind. Sin informs us that killing the beast has awoken all the old gods. How does Sin know this? Because Sin is the creator of the beast. Sin created the beast specifically to keep the gods at bay in a deep slumber, the Nightmare. This nightmare was powerful enough to keep all the gods asleep, but it also drew the attention of many power-seeking mortals throughout Rayclast's history. And here we thought we were saving the world by killing the beast. Or maybe Valenta was right, and we had no benevolent intentions in slaying the beast. Perhaps we are just killers and opportunists ourselves. Sin wants to see the gods of old subdued once more, and since we were able to slay Malachi and the beast, Sin tasks us with this, with promises of more power. After we defeat Innocence and meet Sin, we emerge from the Chamber of Innocence to find a man named Bannon, demanding we explain ourselves. Bannon was a former Blackguard, as the Ebony Legion we have seen on Rayclast originates in Oriath under the High Templars. When we re-enter the Templar courts, everything is now on fire. The destruction of Innocence has allowed the other god present in Oriath to take over. He has marked himself all over the Templar courts with a red X, and his cultists run amok. This is Kitava, the Karui god that Utula had mentioned earlier and that Kaum himself feared. When we return to the Overseer's Tower, Bannon is waiting for us, but Utula is missing. Lani informs us that Utula left as soon as Innocence was vanquished, claiming he was called by Kitava. 
Valenta tells us Innocence's Staff of Purity is a real weapon we can find in the ossuary, and that we should use it to defeat Katava. Lani knows of ancient Karui artifacts in the reliquary, a place where holy relics are kept, and she believes we may learn more about Kitava there. The Oriath Square is in ruins as well, covered in the blood and fervor of Kitava's cultists. We must traverse this ruined square to find the information and tools suggested to defeat Kitava. When we enter the square, we can hear Utula shouting to the followers of Kitava, yelling what seems like a sermon. Fun fact! Utula has his Sermon of Kitava written down by Erwin of Theopolis into the Holy Book of Hunger, clearly in the style of religious texts even calling himself High Priest Utula. Utula has been transformed by Kitava into Itula Stone and Steel. We defeat this monstrous vision of Utula and continue on to the reliquary. The reliquary is a place where ancient and holy relics are kept, and here we can find three relics of the Karui gods. As we gather the Karui artifacts for Lani, we find writings about Kitaba himself. The three entries chronicle the story of Kitaba and Tukahama. To summarize, Aruhungai, daughter of the moon, wanted to have a feast for Tukahama returning from war with the first ones of the Ezemites. Tawa, son of the forest, gathered birds to be cooked for the feast. Kitava, the god of hunger, told Aruhangai he would watch the birds as they cooked, but instead he ate all of them. When Tukahama arrived, Aruhangai told what happened and asked for Kitava to be punished. Tukahama pulled out his tooth, one of the artifacts we find, and cut Kitava across the face in two diagonal strokes, blinding him and marking him with a large X which we've seen symbolized in the Templar courts and spoilers we will see face to face later. To replace the birds Kitava ate, Tukahama and Velako, father of the storm, go fishing with Kitava. In the boat, Kitava eats all the bait for the fish. Velako takes off his own jaw, the second Karui artifact, and hooks Kitava, intending to use him as bait for the fish instead. At the bottom of the sea, Kitava eats all of the fish. When Tukahama and Velako pull him up, they decide Kitava needs ultimate punishment. They take Kitava to Hinakora, the mother of death. They ask Hinakora to kill Kitava so that he does not starve the rest of the Karui. Hinakora decides death is not the correct punishment, as a lesson needs to be learned. Hinakora beats Kitava with a whip made of her own hair, the third Karui artifact. She drives him to the underworld with her hair whip and leaves him to suffer without food or water for eternity. And that is where Kitava had remained, starving and tormented. That is, until we killed the beast and set the gods free. While this may seem like a fable intended to teach mortals a lesson, we can assume at least some of the tale is literal. The artifacts are real, and as we've seen, so is Kitava. The ossuary is a place where the bones of dead Oriath are placed. As we make our way through the maze of bones, we find the Staff of Purity. With knowledge of Kitava and the Staff of Purity, we make off for the cathedral to face Kitava. Kitava is on the roof of the Theopolis Cathedral. Kitava is a primal god like sin or innocence, unlike the mortals who became gods. He is the god of hunger. His punishment by the other Karui gods has inflamed his desire to consume. When Malachi spoke to Kaum through Nightmare, he told Kaum that the world was infested with Kitava's followers, and that Tukahama would give Kaum an offering to free his Karui from oppression. Haku, a Karui, believes that Kaum's vision to lead his Karui to Mount Verusa was actually Kitava's corruption, bringing him to madness and turning Kaum into one of Kitava's slaves, like Utula. While Kaum's vision may have actually been a dream from Nightmare with a Karui interpretation rather than Kitava's direct influence, it seems Kitava can truly corrupt and consume everything around him. Kitava's massive size and power seem an imminent threat to Oriath. Just like the beast before, we will attempt to defeat something that has been undefeated for centuries. We take Innocence's Staff of Purity and plant it like a banner to aid us in this fight. Kitava is insanely powerful, and halfway through the battle, the Staff of Purity is broken, 
and so are we. We fall to the ground, and Sin flies down to gather us before we are consumed by Kitava. Sin carries us to the Oriath docks, where a woman named Lily Roth offers to sail us back to Rayclast. Thank you so much for watching It's Your Boy Noodle. If you haven't watched the rest of the series, go ahead and check the playlist for those. If you are interested in voting for upcoming videos or seeing pictures of my cat, think about checking the Patreon. And of course, don't forget to like, subscribe, smash that bell button. If you have any questions about the series, feel free to check out my Twitch at twitch.tv slash kittencatnoodle. And until the next one, stay sane, exile.